Chapter 96, Jungle of Death Dirk was able to sleep for six hours, which was an amount of time he was more than satisfied with. When he woke, he continued running in a single direction. Dirk made sure he didn't turn or run in zigzags so as to get out of the jungle as fast as possible. Because the longer he stayed in the jungle, the higher the chances of him being killed were. Shing! Dirk swung his knife, slicing a snake in half. While he ran, it had suddenly jumped off a tree, shooting at him like a bullet. It had been a surprise attack, but Dirk's instincts and reflexes allowed him to move before he even thought about moving. Dirk encountered dozens and hundreds of monsters of all types. Many of them were camouflaged, and even with Dirk's heightened mana sense, he had a hard time seeing them. But under such high stress where he was forced to spot his enemies or be killed, Dirk's senses sharpened to their utmost degree. Dirk had already done experiments with the limits of his mana sense. His mana sense extended out in a 30-meter radius, giving him a clear and sharp view of anything within that radius. Beyond that, Dirk was only able to faintly make out images, and this faint sense dropped off for around 100 meters before fading into nothing. That meant that beyond 100 meters, Dirk was absolutely blind. But while his mana sense may not have been as nice as vision, he was actually able to discover more than if he had his vision. The animals that used stealth in this jungle usually covered themselves up with dense mana. Dirk sometimes couldn't sense heat from an animal, but he could sense the thick earth mana that comprised their strong bodies. There were all these little clues that Dirk picked up on, and he learned to use his mana sense more than before. And his mana sense was actually more responsive than vision. Vision had a delay when the brain processed the light that came into the eyes. But mana sense, as far as Dirk knew, came from the soul or the like. That meant that Dirk sensed things in real time. The instant something happened, the changes were sensed. It gave him much greater reaction speeds, even though he still had to take the time to move his body. Thankfully, his reflexes were also fantastic. It was no exaggeration to say that Dirk's life, while being preserved by his stored potion, was saved many times over by his mana sense. He avoided instant death situations that were all too plentiful in this jungle. But Dirk didn't stop at just sharpening his mana sense. After another day, Dirk began developing his dark mana sense. Spite had spoken of using dark mana to see dark things. Dirk had followed that logic and began looking through the dark mana around him. While he couldn't control the dark mana due to Eldritch Primordial, he could still sense it. And Dirk was shocked to find out that he could indeed see dark things. Specifically, he saw darkness. Shadows were everywhere, and they were created by something blocking light. Different materials also absorbed light in different ways, creating colors and varying levels of brightness. There was light, and then lack of light. Dirk tuned into this lack of light. It was like he could see things in black and white. It took Dirk a while, but he was able to see things in different shades depending on how much light there was. Regardless if something was lit up with a flashlight, there was still dark mana. Dirk picked up on this dark mana and depending on the amount, he could form images in his mind. Like that, Dirk began to see things from the perspective of light and no light. Of course, it was still mana, but it made it seem more like normal vision. And most importantly, Dirk was able to pick up on sources of light. By detecting areas of little to no dark mana, he could infer that it was a source of a large amount of light. And with contextual information, he figured out what the source of light was. Maybe it was the sun being reflected off of a small puddle, or a shiny plant that was actually a deadly enemy waiting to eat Dirk alive. Dirk was able to sense a whole new level of detail. The only thing missing was color. Of course, even this black and white sense had to be developed. Dirk was actually thrown off by it when he tried to connect the things he was seeing through dark mana with the objects he saw through earth or fire mana but Dirk was eager to regain what could be thought of as an alternative to vision, so he worked on it with gusto. Like that, he spent another two days running and dodging death in the jungle. Across each day, Dirk used about a quarter of his potion supply. At the end of the second day, he settled down during the night. Damn. I can't keep going like this. Dirk frowned as he grabbed a nearby vine. 
It was tough, almost like thick wire. He wrapped the vine around his forearm. He began using various items he found in the jungle to his advantage. The vines were one of these items. Because they were tough, he began wrapping them around his forearms and calves, using them as a kind of armor. This saved him from snakes that wanted to bite or slash him and hostile plants that went after his legs. Although cuts and slices weren't deadly, they were definitely annoying. Dirk didn't need to keep building up wounds. Still, his body was being continuously worn down, and he didn't have much potion left. He didn't know how long this jungle would go on for, so he needed something that gave him more longevity. He thought for a second as Spite jumped onto his lap. The two looked at each other. Gun. Roger. Spite responded before disappearing. The next moment, a black and gold pistol appeared in Dirk's hand. Dirk hadn't yet used this pistol. Because he was constantly moving and conserving energy, he needed reconnaissance more than firepower. Spite helped him more in its cat form than pistol form as it could run ahead and preemptively spot enemies. It could even act as bait, bringing hidden enemies out of their holes. This had saved Dirk an amazing amount of trouble. But things were about to change. Dirk decided that he needed to be more aggressive. Rather than hide from the enemies, he needed to take the fight to them. While he didn't think he could kill everything in this jungle, he could at least keep them from continuously hurting him. Dirk raised the pistol. He pushed his mana into it, and the golden circuits glowed. Runes seemed to be engraved on the body of the pistol above the circuits as they fluctuated with fiery power. Then, he pulled the trigger. From the barrel shot out a fireball that exploded on a distant tree. The body dimmed rapidly afterward, ready for another use. Dirk was impressed. Although he had been slow with the activation, he could intuitively understand how the pistol worked. He pulled the trigger three times, and within a mere second, three fireballs shot out in succession. They all exploded on the same tree, and that tree quickly split in half under the magic, collapsing with a thud. Very nice. Dirk smiled brightly. It was a magic tool. A spellcaster. Dirk felt that it was many times easier to cast spells when using this pistol than normal. Spite chimed in. Your mind controls mana and creates runes, and usually, you need to form the runes and create a magic circuit in order to form a complete and stable spell. But when using your stigma, you bypass the need to make a circuit. The pistol is the circuit, and the spell creation process is expedited to bring about the manifestation quicker. This vastly increases speed and efficiency, consuming less mana and energy. At least, that's my understanding. Not only that, because the stigma is formed from your soul, you are capable of determining the amount of energy you infuse on the fly, as if selecting a value. However, I have found two limitations to the pistol. What limitations? The amount of energy you can infuse. In any single shot, you cannot infuse more than a certain amount of energy, an amount I surmise is around 10% of your entire energy pool. Also, the speed at which you can fire depends on your proficiency in forming the runes of the spell. You may not need to make a stable magic circle, but you still need to know and form the runes as if silent casting. Hmm. Dirk tilted his head as he observed the pistol more. Eventually, he shrugged. That's fine. I'm actually more concerned with the spells that are being fired off. This thing is like a magic wand, but its purpose is to fire at ranged targets. To take full advantage of that, I need fast projectiles that pack a punch, like bullets. There are no known spells of such types, only perhaps a single fire spell that resembles a bullet when compressed enough. So we'll have to make our own. Understood. There is one more thing you should know about the pistol though. Hmm. Suddenly, Dirk heard a click from the pistol. He moved his hand, and a magazine dropped from the grip. This magazine is capable of storing spells. Again, you cannot infuse more than 10% of your power into any one spell, but you can store up to 8 spells within and fire them without expenditure. This will be helpful for when you run low on energy. Yes, it will be. Dirk was happily surprised as he played with the magazine. 
there were eight capsules within the magazine resembling cartridges. Thinking, Dirk took out one of the cartridges and cast a spell on it. It was a simple fireball spell. When it was cast, the cartridge consumed the spell, and a fiery bullet was formed. He put the bullet back into the magazine, loading it into the gun as he racked the slide. Bang! Ching! After firing the gun, Dirk saw the cartridge eject. It flew a few feet to the side and disappeared, automatically returning to the bottom of the magazine. At the same time, the same fireball as previously flew out and hit another tree. Very nice. Dirk smiled even wider. The next moment though, he looked back at the body of the gun. On the side of it in the middle of the body, the golden circuits seemed to come together at a single point. And at this point was an empty cavity a bit bigger than a marble. Dirk tilted his head. What's this cavity? I'm not entirely sure about its function, only that it connects to the entire circuit system through the gun, almost like a power nexus. So could I put something in there? Like a mana crystal? You would need to do so to find out. All right. If I get my hands on one, then I'll try. Until then, let's load these bullets. That night, Dirk took some time to load his gun. He only loaded five bullets before being exhausted of all his energy, but those were five potential lifesavers. He was more than happy, and fell asleep content. The next day, Dirk took the fight to the jungle. Ching! His pistol constantly released fireballs and arrows at various enemies that appeared in front of him. It consumed more energy, and focusing on the enemies for any amount of time slowed him down. But he was wounded much less, and by extension, had to use less of his life-saving potion. More than that though, Dirk seemed to have too much fun with his new toy. Ching! He smiled as he fired a small metal arrow at a monkey. It had swung around and harassed him for a while, throwing rocks faster than a professional baseball pitcher. But this arrow was perfectly placed, and the monkey was nailed to a branch. It screamed only for a moment before another arrow ended its life. Although Dirk didn't have bullets, he could still cast similar magic. He found himself using arrows despite their slow projectile speed. And with his accuracy, there was very little he couldn't hit with absolute precision. Of course, some animals were just too fast. Like a group of hummingbirds that Dirk had to escape from. They zipped around with the wind, making it impossible for him to hit them with his slow arrows. In the end, Dirk had to use three of his prepared spells, releasing three huge fireballs that burned most of them, as well as the surrounding forest, to a crisp. And so, Dirk ended his thrilling day when night fell. He dug himself a hole underneath a tree and used it as his tent. He frowned as he reflected on the battles he fought. Spite sat on his lap in its cat form. I need to be able to see farther. This had been a problem for a while now. Dirk could only see clearly for thirty meters around him. After that, it was a blur that only got worse for one hundred meters. Realistically, Dirk could only make out objects up to fifty meters away. The rest was too blurry to make absolute judgments. At first, Dirk had thought that his dark mana sense could fix that. Light came from everywhere, so no matter how far, he should be able to pick up on different shades of light, producing black and white vision. But that proved to be much more difficult to do than he initially thought. He still often found his dark mana sense to show different things from his other senses. He couldn't reliably trust it. So he needed something else. Something that could give him at least a glance at something further away than fifty meters. And Spite had a good idea. Sonar. She spoke a concept only known to him who came from Earth. Sonar creates pulses of sound that spread out and return when they hit something. You can do that with mana. It won't be constant, but you should be able to catch glimpses of objects at a distance. Interesting. How would I do that? No idea. Spite quickly gave up. Although it was much more logical and interactive than the previous AI, it wasn't all-knowing. Most of what it said were merely facts that both of them already knew. Throwing out this idea was merely taking inspiration from Dirk's thoughts and memories. So Dirk got to thinking. Pulses of mana? No, 
That would be too obvious, wouldn't it? It would also consume a lot of mana. What about pulses of energy? Instead of sending out mana, I can just disrupt the mana already there by shaking it with energy. That would make the mana visible, right? Would it? How are you able to see mana in the first place? What causes it to be visible? That's a fantastic question. Let me know when you find the answer to it. Spite drooped its ears at the sarcasm, causing Dirk to chuckle and pet it. Dirk started petting Spite a lot more since it had such soft and warm fur. It was also the only physical interaction he had with anything that didn't involve killing right now. He just enjoyed it. Anyway, let's try it out tomorrow. Dirk ended the night with that. In the next morning, he was fighting for his life once more. Ching! Ugh! Dirk frowned at the headache that came over him. More so though at the bite wound on his leg. He could feel paralyzing poison stream through his blood vessels. After his nanites blocked off the vessels though, potion was injected, getting rid of the poison and healing Dirk. You have enough potion for two more lethal injuries. Dirk frowned even more at Spite's words. After a bit he just sighed. Do I need to slow my pace? Dirk pondered as he grabbed a vine, wrapping it around his bloody arm. After tying it, he sat down on a rock, squashing a couple large bugs that tried to crawl up his foot. The gun in his hand transformed back into a cat. Spite looked at him with its golden eyes. The longer you remain in the jungle, the more enemies you face. But I run into enemies too often if I move fast. Well it is a jungle. Problem is my stealth doesn't help as much as it should. That's because you're not remaining absolutely still and cutting off your senses. So do I slow down? The longer you remain in the Jew dash. I get it. Dirk interrupted Spite's repetitive words with a sigh. There was no good way to avoid enemies and injury in this place. Even when Dirk did use stealth, hawk-like enemies would always spot him one way or another. It seems like you're getting closer to the edge though. Spite spoke those words of confidence. After a while, Dirk noticed the stronger enemies become scarcer. There were fewer steroid bears, fewer massive alligators, fewer killer monkeys, and fewer frog armies. This at least meant that he was getting away from the center. I really hope things get easier soon. If I get into a bad situation without the potion, I could lose my life. We can only use everything at our disposal. Luckily you've had some success with your new sonar technique. That alerted us of several unfavorable situations. Hmm. Dirk nodded. For the past day, he had worked on and succeeded in creating an elemental pulse technique. The technique actually worked by employing Dirk's mana resonance skill. Using it, he resonated the mana in a wave, and any mana caught in this wave would resonate with the material it was inside or around. This gave Dirk not only a clear view of things far away, but gave him the sharpest image of material he had ever seen since developing his mana sense and he could do it directionally too. Dirk had learned to send out a pulse toward his front, and by concentrating that power, he was able to get a detailed image of everything in a 200-meter cone. He used that periodically to avoid monsters. And best of all, it only slightly alerted the monsters. Their heads would raise and they would look around, clearly having felt something. But they wouldn't know from where. This allowed Dirk to retain a bit of stealth. It was incredibly useful, and that was only the crude prototype. There was still a lot of refining to do. I really have a lot of spells to work on. Nothing like practical tests to make them better. Practical tests are usually better when my life isn't at stake. Stress makes you sharper. That's true. Dirk smirked as he ruffled the cat's hair. After that, he called it a night. He hoped there wasn't much farther to go or at the very least, that there weren't any difficult enemies in front of him. Chapter 97, City Dirk ran for another two days. The first day got a bit easier. Dirk actually didn't use up the rest of his potion. Thanks to his elemental sonar, his dark mana vision, his improving stealth, his pistol stigma, and his sharpening reflexes, he was able to avoid more death and injury. Not only that, but he remembered another ability he had gained upon completing blood destruction. 
he could use aura, a power that gave his fists vast destructive power. Dirk didn't find too much use for this though. Most of the strong monsters he found were too tough to be wounded by his weak attacks or too dangerous to even approach. He was mostly defending, and any attacks he did send out were mostly ways to distract and divert, allowing him to escape. Dirk couldn't get into head-on fights and let his wounds build up, even though he had decided to play more aggressive. But it was still a tool that he could utilize when the situation called for it. It allowed Dirk to break through many barriers and kill bugs using something other than fire. He liked using it on mosquitoes, especially. It was another tool that, although not used often, gave him yet another edge. And with his accumulating techniques and skills, Dirk found himself finding a way out of the jungle of death. The first thing he started to notice was the lack of obscenely strong monsters, like the steroid bear. In fact, he didn't see any the entire second day. The second thing he noticed was the change in foliage. Gone were all the poison-spewing and man-eating plants. Dirk began to see berry bushes and fruit trees. There was thinner grass, fewer vines, shorter trees, not as much mud, clearer water, and all-around brighter scenery. In these places, Dirk found animals like wolves, deer, small birds, smaller bears, much smaller bugs, and no frog armies. He saw many enemies, but now, all of them were enemies he could safely fight. In reasonable amounts, of course. At one point, Dirk got swarmed by a pack of sixty wolves in the middle of the night. That had been a rude wake-up call. But he got out of it. Even sixty wolves were reasonable compared to a steroid bear. Dirk could actually wound and kill them. Like that, he found himself nearing signs of civilization at the end of the second day. It was a good thing too because he had just gone through the rest of his potion. Like that, he was brought to the third day. On this day, Dirk disregarded any and all enemies as he rushed forward, following the signs of civilization. And by noon, he emerged. The frontier city of Kalaba. Due to it being on the edges of what Dirk called the jungle of death, it was a mix between a city and a stronghold. It didn't look super appealing unless one liked the fortress aesthetic. Nonetheless, it was incredibly popular and had a booming economy. There were four reasons for this. The first was actually due to the jungle of death right beside it. Because of the plentiful source of monsters and animals right next door, the city had a large mercenary and hunter presence that lived off of killing and gathering biological resources. The meat industry in this city was booming. The second was the fact of a mine being near this city. Thus, there were many miners that provided a steady source of income and resources. The material processing industry was also booming. The third reason was due to a dungeon being inside of the city. And not just any dungeon, but a major dungeon that was a step above what Dirk had fought in. This attracted a small but powerful dungeon diver population. And the more powerful the fighter, the richer they were. Heaps of wealth were moved whenever they made transactions. Finally, one of the biggest reasons for this city's prosperity was its location. This city was located eastern border of the Horizon Empire. And next to the Horizon Empire was the Dwarven Haven. If one went above the jungle of death and traced its outskirts, they would eventually find themselves entering Dwarven territory. The Dwarven Haven and Horizon Empire traded often, both diplomatically and commercially. In fact, the two empires had a fantastic standing with each other due to all this trade. It boosted both their economies. And a large amount of this trade funneled right through the frontier city of Kalaba. This city seemed to have everything. The only downside was the fact that this city needed to maintain a standing army and be able to defend against tides of monsters from the jungle of death. Either way, this city was massive and rich. So when it was approached by a boy covered in blood, mud, and vines, it naturally raised its alert. Dirk exited the jungle and entered a wide open clearing where there were no trees or plants, only grass. And in the distance he spotted the city of Kalaba. It had walls that were fifty meters tall and extended left and right for nearly five miles. Buildings even taller than the walls towered from within the strong defenses. They got gradually taller until they reached the center where there was a 500-meter-tall palace. 
the palace actually had objects floating in and out of it, though Dirk couldn't make out what they were. In fact, the only reason Dirk was able to see any of this magnificent view was due to his dark mana vision that created black and white images based on light. It was generally hit or miss with the accuracy, but Dirk got the gist. This city is huge. I'm surprised steroid bears haven't destroyed it yet. Dirk said that as he walked toward the huge walls. There were about 500 meters of grassland between the edge of the forest and the walls, so Dirk stuck out as he approached. After getting closer and letting out some elemental pulses, Dirk was able to find the gates to the city. The gates were naturally huge, and there was a long line of wagons and people flowing in. But Dirk didn't plan to enter the normal way. He didn't forget that Azura was probably looking for him, so he couldn't attract attention. Thus, his brain warmed up a little as he thought of a way in. Ah, damn. The hell is that smell? Which one of you are letting your cheeks puff? Not me boss. It was definitely Jeremy. Ha. Ah. Mine don't smell this nice. A dwarf waved his hand as an odor suddenly washed over his group. They were rolling in a wagon up to the gates, eventually getting stopped by the guards. ID check please. Right here. The head dwarf pulled out a card when requested. The guard had an orb in his hand, and he inserted the card into the orb. When it glowed green, he took it out and handed it back. All good. Are you transporting any goods that are on the list of illegal contraband? As if I would tell you. Sure, sure. The guard just let out a breath at the dwarf's laugh. At the same time, a few other guards did shallow checks on the caravan before giving a thumbs up. All good. Head in. Of course. Like that, the caravan rolled forward. Suddenly though, there was an alarm as some barriers suddenly raised in front of the wagon. Huh. Sir. There are suspicious magic fluctuations in the wagon. Dark type. Shing. A few guards suddenly drew their swords at that moment. The head guard also narrowed his eyes at the dwarf, who hastily waved. I didn't do anything. I'm not even a mage. Step down. The dwarf was pulled off the wagon and restrained, as were all the other dwarves. Then, guards flooded into the wagons, checking every nook and cranny. Suddenly though, as one of the guards bent down to look under the wagon, he was kicked away. Boom! The guard flew away from the wagon and into a wall, leaving behind cracks. Then, a body shot out from under the wagon. The head guard shouted. Seize that man! Get him! The surroundings guards all rushed out as the alarms blared. Dirk, who was the culprit, gritted his teeth. I hid from Azura with this stealth. Why can't it get past a security checkpoint? Dirk grumbled as he dashed to the side. There was a doorway inside the walls where the guards would occasionally rest, so he made his way through there, dodging all the resting guards and shooting out into the city. He quickly bounded with his full strength onto the roof of a building. A few guards followed, chasing him down with their full strength. Unfortunately, Dirk was someone who could keep his life in the presence of a steroid bear. After jumping across a couple rooftops, he slipped between buildings, through alleyways, through open windows, and weaved through crowds of people. The guards couldn't keep up with his agility, and before long, he disappeared. Where'd he go? I don't know. Well look harder. No you look harder. The guards started bickering before searching around the place. Dirk, on the other hand, had slipped into a shop. It was a nice little fruit store, and when Dirk turned around, he saw a young woman no older than fourteen years old manning the front desk. She looked at Dirk with a terrified gaze. His body that was covered in mud and blood. The open, unhealed wounds. The dark vines tied around his arms and legs. His eyes that had horrible black cracks all over them. His six-foot-tall body. The intimidating chiseled muscles. This little girl couldn't help but shiver. Thinking, Dirk put his finger over his lips to tell her to be quiet. Then, he walked over to a shelf, grabbing a fruit and eating it. Oh my god. His head rolled back a little as he tasted the sweet juices. 
for over two years he had eaten slop. He hadn't tasted anything else other than blood when it pooled in his mouth. This was the first real stimulation of his taste buds in a long time. You didn't actually eat anything in the jungle either. The potion made me not hungry. Dirk spoke simply as he ate one fruit and grabbed another. As he said, the potion basically removed the need for food. Even in the mountain there were times when he wouldn't eat for days or weeks simply because Delaha kept whipping him during his free time. He had lived off the potion for a long time. After eating two fruits though, Dirk eventually reined himself in. He looked at the girl, who looked back at him with silent fear and a bit of anger. He was taking their food, after all. Feeling sorry, Dirk suddenly looked at his arm. On both forearms, two knives were sheathed and the vines tied around them. He unsheathed one of them and walked over to the girl. And no! Thud! The girl stumbled backward before hearing a heavy object land on the front desk. Looking up, she saw that Dirk placed the knife on the desk. I hope that's good enough for payment. The girl was silent as Dirk turned and walked out, taking one more fruit with him. Like that, he disappeared, and the girl stared at the large, crude knife on the table that was stained with blood and bigger than her leg. After leaving the shop, Dirk found a tall building and climbed to the top of it. He let out a long breath as he felt a breeze blow past his body. I need to blend in. After a while, he made his plans while taking another bite of his fruit. Dirk couldn't go walking around looking like a forest monster. He had to clean his body, get some clothes, and look normal. While he didn't have the money for clothes or a bath, he did have the skills to get those things anyway. I have yet to ever steal anything in this life. A first time for everything. Spite spoke as it appeared on Dirk's shoulder in its cat form. He chuckled and scratched its chin. Spite apparently liked it as its chin raised itself to be scratched better. Or maybe it was just playing the part of a cat. Anyway, let's go make myself pretty. Like that, Dirk jumped off the building and made his way around the city. It was a bright and sunny day, and for the first time in a while, Dirk's mood reflected that. After around four hours, Dirk had made himself presentable. First he found a bathhouse. It wasn't open during the middle of the day but that only made it easier for Dirk to use its facilities without notice. He just had to avoid the owner who lived there. Using that, he cleaned his entire body, ridding himself of all the mud and blood. The bath that was the size of a pool had turned completely brown when he was done. After cleaning out his wounds and using soaps to make his skin nice and glossy, Dirk felt like a new man. He also thoroughly washed his only pair of shorts. At first, Dirk also wanted to dispose of the vines. But after they were soaked in the water, their skin peeled off, and Dirk saw what was inside. The vines actually had a wire-like core inside of them. Seeing that, Dirk went and skinned all the vines, exposing their cores. Then, he burned them to make their surfaces smooth and hard. With that, Dirk could keep them, not looking weird for having plants tied on his body. He only kept two of the vines though, one for each forearm. That way he could sheath his knife. As for the other arm, Dirk thought about throwing away the extra vine, but then he saw the large metal tattoo with a big number 8. This was the harbinger mark that Dirk was given, a permanent brand on his body that had never come off. Dirk decided that he didn't want to go waving it around, so he kept another vine to cover it. Like that. Dirk exited the bathhouse and found himself a nice clothing shop. It was at this point that Dirk could only apologize to the owner silently. He didn't want to give away his other knife, but he still needed clothes. So using his stealth, Dirk was able to hide in plain sight. He then found himself a new pair of shorts, shoes, socks, and a shirt. By the end, he looked like a sharp young man from a well-off family, if one looked past the few exposed wounds of course. After that, he tied the vines to his forearms and sheathed his knife. It wasn't odd for people to walk around with all kinds of weapons since this city had tons of dungeon divers and hunters, so he wouldn't look that out of place. The last problem though was his eyes. The black cracks that glowed with the power of the curse would definitely freak people out and cast suspicion. So Dirk tore a piece of cloth from a garment and tied it around his head, covering up the cursed cracks. 
With that, Dirk only looked mildly suspicious as he finally entered the streets of the city openly. Since guards were still patrolling the place, he just avoided them. Spite appeared on Dirk's shoulder as he walked around and sensed all the people and buildings. What are your plans now? Get back to the capital city. That's where the academy is and my parents are. I have to find out where I am though and how to get there. I also don't have money, though I could use my skills to maybe take up a guard position for a merchant. Dirk pondered. He was a stranger in a strange place. The only thing he knew was the name of this city, Kalaba, and that was only because he had sensed the large sign while crossing the city gates. Other than that, he had no idea where he was. So he wandered for a while, pondering what he would do. At that moment though, he suddenly felt a wave of dark mana. Dirk's senses shook a bit as he turned his head. On the rooftop of a large building, there was a woman dressed in black. Dirk saw her, and his eyebrows raised. Cecilia had long since arrived at the frontier city of Calaba. With her came a dozen subordinates. All of them were assigned jobs. Four of them were assigned to the four city gates into the city. The other eight people were told to scour the nearby jungle for people. They were to report all anomalies. It had been a few days since she did this, and with each passing hour, Cecilia got more and more anxious. That was, until one of her people came running back to her. Madam. Speak. The East Gate. There was a commotion when a suspicious person was caught by our special dark mana detectors. They ran off and escaped the pursuing guards not long after being spotted. What did they look like? Cecilia suddenly stood from her seat with seriousness. The man hastily spoke. Tall, completely covered in mud, and they smelled. He skillfully evaded capture, so we don't know where he is. I understand. Assign patrols to look. I'm also going. Saying that, Cecilia almost ran out of the building, disappearing to the east gate. The man also ran out, going to give orders. After that, Cecilia scoured the city around the east gate for hours. She didn't find anybody at the edges near the walls, so she gradually made her way deeper in. She sent out waves of dark mana to skin everyone in the vicinity, constantly going from area to area. For a while, her hope that had spiked began to go down. But then, the fourth hour came. Cecilia let out a wave of dark mana from atop a roof. The people in the vicinity felt something faint, but generally disregarded the odd chill that washed over them. For a minute, Cecilia stood still. She processed the information she received, simultaneously looking around at everybody. But then, she was interrupted. She turned as a young man jumped onto her same roof. She froze. The young man looked at her. To Cecilia, he might as well be a stranger. He didn't look like her son, that little thirteen-year-old boy. But she could feel it. Perhaps it was her motherly instinct, or the sharp jawline. But she immediately knew. Dirk? She barely spoke, her voice already cracking under emotion. Dirk smiled back at his mother, someone who he had longed to see for a really long time. Hi mom. Chapter 98, Withdrawals Slash Adapt Cecilia couldn't seem to move. She felt like she wanted to dive to her son, embracing him right then and there. But then she remembered what had happened. Dirk had spent two and a half years at Azura's Mountain. She had already heard of the hell he had gone through. Getting whipped every single day, his tolerance rising so much that they used the level 10 whip on him. He was constantly tormented, Azura constantly trying to break him. Azura planted hate in people's minds, using that to control them. She knew that more than anyone. She had heard the report from the two infiltrators. She knew that Dirk resisted Azura, that he resisted the constant torture. But she didn't know Dirk's state of mind. Did he hate her? Did he resent her for not being able to do anything for two and a half years? Had Azura twisted him into some sort of monster? Just because he fought Azura didn't mean he was still on her side. She didn't know. For all she knew, he would attack and try to kill her as soon as he saw her. Or he would just spit at her feet and walk away, never wishing to see her again. 
she knew the hate Azura could fill people with. And she feared the worst. She feared that she lost her baby, the stoic child that liked her hugs but never admitted it. But she saw his smile. She saw how much he had grown, the wounds on his body, the bearing of a strong man. His voice was calm, deeper than it was before. Most of all, it was bright. It was happy. Dirk couldn't see his mother as he used to. He could only sense the dark mana that flowed through and around her body, along with other fine details provided by his earth mana and fire mana. But when he faced her, he also knew. This was his mother. He couldn't see her loving eyes anymore, but that didn't matter. He was happy. Hi mom. He spoke with a wide smile. He was now taller than his mother, but he still felt like a child in front of her. Though, he wasn't really sure what to say. So many things had happened, and he didn't really have the time to think about this moment. So he just said what came to mind. It's, nice to see you oof. My baby. Dirk was interrupted as Cecilia suddenly ran forward, almost crashing into him as she wrapped him up in a hug. He smiled as he quickly hugged her back. She cried. I'm so sorry. I'm. I'm so glad you're safe. I'm so sorry I couldn't find you sooner. Tears poured from Cecilia's eyes as she grabbed Dirk with a shocking amount of strength. Dirk activated a bit of anima to resist her powerful hug, but smiled brightly nonetheless. It's okay, Mom. I'm back. I'm right here. My child is back. I'm never going to let you go again, Dirk. So does that mean I can't dungeon dive? He. Sniff. Cecilia couldn't help but chuckle. The two continued to hug, Cecilia's cries dying down. Do you hate your mother? She suddenly asked, causing Dirk to noticeably recoil. Cecilia felt his flinch and gritted her teeth a bit. She seemed to melt at the answer though. I love you, Mom. No amount of back scratching is going to change that. I love you too, my child. Your mother will always love you. Cecilia responded with a tighter hug when Dirk strengthened his own embrace. After another little while, they separated. Cecilia wiped her face and fixed her hair while Dirk shook out his now sore muscles. Ugh, I haven't cried like that in a while. You ruined my makeup, child. You wore makeup? I'll take that as a compliment. Cecilia huffed a bit with a bright smile. After making herself presentable, she turned back to Dirk and gave him a kiss on the forehead. Welcome back, sweetie. Thank, you. What's wrong? Cecilia tilted her head when Dirk spoke unsurely. He was frowning. Then, Dirk suddenly bent over, falling to one knee. His mouth opened, and blood poured out like water. Dirk? Cough. My, stomach. Dirk could barely speak before coughing up more blood. Then, he saw something in his mind. Alert. Extreme body decomposition detected. Genetic anomalies detected. Employing trait, adaptable genes. Dirk was a bit baffled by the notifications from spite. Then, he fell over, his entire body weak. Dirk? I'll take you to a doctor, just hang on. Cecilia quickly picked up her child, dashing off across the buildings to the palace in the center of the city. As she did, she cast dark healing spells on him. It didn't seem to help though as more blood poured out. She could also feel his previously strong body become suddenly frail. She ran as fast as she could, and before long, she found just who she needed. It's withdrawals. Cecilia sat beside Dirk's bed. Sitting across from her was a doctor, someone with the light attribute who specialized in healing. After bringing Dirk in, Cecilia had this doctor personally take care of him, using her name as a Marcianus and the threat of death if he didn't move. Luckily, he didn't resist and immediately got to work. With a bit of healing magic and potions, Dirk's body was stabilized. He remained conscious through the entire thing, even now as the doctor explained what caused this sudden change. Cecilia frowned as the man adjusted a monocle. 
when a person uses potions constantly over long periods of time or gets their body repaired by healing magic just as often, their bodily systems become dependent on the potion or healing to function. I've seen it a lot in dungeon divers who consistently sustain wounds and then consistently get artificially healed. After a long time, their body can't function without it, and if they stop, they'll experience an adverse reaction. It usually results in being sick for a few days and weakness in the body. It also affects the weak more than the strong, so people at a certain level can ignore withdrawals outright. But not only is your son only rank 4, but I've never seen such an extreme case of this condition. Your son would have died without intervention, and it took a shocking amount of healing potion to stabilize him. Both Dirk and his mother frowned deeply at his words. Dirk immediately knew the situation while Cecilia could surmise it. The doctor continued. He'll need to remain here for at least two weeks as we allow his body to reacclimate. He'll need a regular dose of healing potion that I'll personally adjust every day. And I'll warn you in advance, but the process will be very uncomfortable. He may not be able to even walk for the duration. He just needs to rest until he's no longer dependent. I understand. Thank you doctor. Of course. With a nod, the man stood and left. He closed the door to the room, giving them privacy. Do you want to explain? Cecilia asked cautiously. She didn't want to bring up his traumatic time at the mountain, but she wanted to know how serious the situation actually was. Dirk just sighed and spoke bluntly. I was beaten near death every single day for those two and a half years. Every time I was. I was given a potion through my bloodstream. Everything from broken bones to ruptured organs to shredded skin was regenerated within hours. Near the end, I could be up and walking in two hours. And I guess the only reason why I didn't react this way earlier was because I stole some potion and used it throughout my time in the jungle. It was only yesterday that I stopped using it. Oh God! Cecilia couldn't help the few tears that went down her cheek. She quickly composed herself though. She could imagine how strong the potion Dirk was given. Not just any potion could bring a man back from death's doorstep in mere hours. If she was being honest, she was baffled by the strength of the potion Azura used and how long he supplied it for. It spoke volumes about the depth of his organization. Either way, Dirk was given that potion every day for around 900 days. It was no wonder his body reacted so violently when the potion suddenly stopped coming. As Dirk had already guessed with spite, his body had even begun to replace food with the potion. Dirk didn't even feel hungry in the several days he was in the jungle. The potion replaced vital functions, and his body became reliant on it. It was like an addict suddenly coming off of a drug, only much worse in the backlash. Now, he had to slowly get his body to work as it did before. Only, when Dirk remembered the notifications he saw while collapsing, he knew that something deeper inside him was changing. Even now he could feel his body going through repairs and alterations. It was odd, but Dirk didn't mention it. Instead, he decided to change the topic. Although he was weak, he had no trouble ignoring the pain. He turned his head. Hey mom. Hmm. I have something I want you to see. Dirk smiled a bit as Cecilia's interest was piqued. Then, a cat suddenly appeared. Black fur, faint golden stripes, and deep golden eyes. Spite appeared in its cat form, looking very real but also a little ethereal at the same time. She was surprised by the cat that looked at her and flicked its tail around. Is it a fairy familiar? Cecilia made a guess as she reached out her hand. Dirk tilted his head at the new concept. Fairy? No. This is my stigma. I formed it while in the mountain. Your stigma? This? She was shocked as she pet the cat, feeling its warm, soft fur. Dirk also knew that this stigma was definitely out of the ordinary. For one, it had two forms. It was also modified and controlled by his AI interface skill. There was no part of this that was normal. But he showed it anyway. He didn't feel like hiding things from his mother. He only wanted to show her something he was proud of. Cecilia smiled a bit as the cat walked and sat on her lap. Your stigma. 
This is amazing. I've never even heard of a stigma like this. I've seen flying swords and a book that walks, but never an animal. Are you controlling it? No. An independent entity. Is it a boy or girl? Or, I don't know if it's even a proper living being. Nonetheless. She was even more surprised. This is by far the most unique stigma I've ever known of. What's it called on your profile? The Black Cat of Calamity. Calamity. She mumbled that word, finding it interesting. Thinking for a second, Dirk called back spite. There's also something else. It has another form. Another? Cecilia's eyes widened as the cat suddenly disappeared. In Dirk's weakly raised hand, the pistol appeared. He explained as she observed it. It's a magic tool that helps with my spellcasting. With it, I don't have to form magic circles. I can directly shoot the magic with this. While I still need to be proficient with the spells, it helps my magic abilities greatly. Dirk pointed the gun as he spoke. The golden circuits suddenly lit up, and runes appeared all around them. Cecilia was a bit mesmerized. More than that though, she was surprised by the detail of the weapon. Dirk, you were definitely weakened for a period after forming the stigma. How long was that period? Not any more than a few days. Why? A few days. Usually when someone forms their stigma, they're weakened for weeks, months, or even years depending on the person's strength. I couldn't fight for three weeks after I formed my stigma. The soul just takes that long to heal. Not only that, but stigma takes time to form. It could take months for the stigma to turn from a crude, unusable object to an actual tool. After forming my saber, I had to wait for two months before using it. Other people may have to wait years for theirs to form. How long did you wait? Maybe those few days? I didn't really have to wait. It was just finished by the time I woke up from recovery. I see. Cecilia nodded in thought. She then looked back at her son who was admiring his stigma. Her eyes widened when she saw his face though. You're bleeding. Hmm. Dirk was confused as his mother reached over and wiped his lip. There was blood streaming out of his nose. I'll get the doctor. It's okay, mom. If anything, I need to go to sleep. Dirk mumbled and sighed. When his arm dropped, the pistol in his hand transformed back into the cat. Spite laid on his lap, curling up. Seeing how haggard her son looked, she once again realized how much he had recently gone through. Not just at the mountain either. He had fought through that jungle to get to the city, and she knew how hostile it was. It was a miracle that he made it back alive. Of course, sweetie. Rest as long as you need. She planted a kiss on his forehead, stroking his cheek before covering him in blankets. She then left the room, spite watching her close the door. You really should go to sleep. Otherwise you might experience more pain than you want to right now. Yes, yes. And I'm basically numb to pain now, so it doesn't matter either way. Before I knock out though, tell me what's going on with my guts. Dirk settled into the bed as he spoke. Spite had actually been urging Dirk to sleep for a while, thus the reason he told his mother he wanted to rest. The reason was because of the potion withdrawals, or the reactions his body was having to the withdrawals. Spite rested itself in a crouching position. When the potion in your body ran out and ceased to provide its effects to your biological systems, your body began to both eat itself and decompose. It was like your organs just fell apart while your muscles decreased in mass. Even your skin corroded. There were very few parts of you that didn't immediately fall apart without the support of the potion. So what was with the activation of my trait? Your body wants to adapt. It wants to fill in the gap that the potion left by itself. Nearly every system in your body is attempting to restructure itself in order to provide the same effects as that potion, only constantly and without external supply. It's doing this in two ways. It wants to use the mana in your blood to mimic the magical effects of the potion, and your cellular genes want to achieve something like regeneration. Of course, naturally generating such significant changes isn't easy, 
so your Nainites are operating under my directive to assist. All right. So my body is changing. Dirk mumbled in summary. In short, yes. Still, it's amazing how malleable your genes became after that trait activated. Right now you have hundreds of clusters of cells that are constantly mutating in order to achieve regeneration. Many of those cell clusters are forms of cancer. Cancer? Don't worry. Even if you did get cancer I could easily cure you. I'll take your word for it. Dirk frowned a bit unsurely. It was amazing the changes that were going on in his body without him knowing. So will I actually get regeneration? Like, grow back chopped off limbs type stuff? No, at least not right now. It'll likely be mild, just enough to cover the effects of the potion. You'll still enjoy the effects though. Assuming I don't get cancer instead. We'll see how the dice roll. Anyway, go to sleep. It'll be easier to work when your body is more vulnerable and defenseless. That's not comforting. Dirk rolled his eyes inwardly before sinking back into his bed. After that, it only took him several seconds to fall asleep. He was really fatigued despite his lively conversation. His body was quick to urge him into recovery mode. With that, Spite focused on working, carrying out biological experiments within the malleable vessel that was Dirk's body. Chapter 99 Recovery Slash Tensions Our son is back. City of Calaba. Riker saw a single message on his transmission device. Unlike Cecilia who had scoured the entire empire, he was back home working on sorting through intelligence. He had taken on the role of a detective for his wife, and piles of paper had stacked themselves on his desks. Of course, that was all swept away by that one message. Without even thinking, Riker activated his magic in order to fly to the city his wife spoke of. He was a literal fireball that streaked through the sky. Using his full power, he was able to cross half the empire, a few thousand mile distance, in only two hours. Of course, he was exhausted afterward, but that didn't matter as much as seeing his son's face. Where is he? Riker burst through a door. Inside, he saw Dirk sleeping on a bed and Cecilia sitting next to him. He ran over, immediately seeing the new face of his son who had disappeared two and a half years ago. He's grown. Yet he's still our son. Cecilia smiled lovingly as she combed Dirk's hair. Hearing those words, Riker couldn't be more relieved. He had also been worried about Dirk changing. It seemed the best case scenario occurred. After combing back Dirk's hair though, Cecilia frowned again. Riker noticed this and sat down beside her. What's wrong? Dirk used vines from the jungle, tying them to his arms. Since he was weak, I took them off. But? She pulled back Dirk's sheet a bit. Then, Riker saw his arm. Along the forearm was a complex metallic tattoo with a large number 8 on it. He was Harbinger 8. Riker almost growled as he realized what it was. Azura wasn't the only one who tormented the Empire. Azura had been a problem for dozens of years, long before Cecilia had ever been tormented by him. And across all that time, he had worked to develop his assassin organization, the Fallen Azuras. And he had success. There were two types of people under Azura. There were the normal underlings, people who carried out orders depending on how strong they were. They disrupted all kinds of businesses all over the empire, being a prevalent nuisance that nobody even knew existed. Then, there were the Harbingers. The Harbingers were the most highly skilled and capable of the assassins under Azura's command. They were unpredictable and impossible to deal with. To many nobles with a high degree of intelligence, they were a famous group of people capable of planting seeds of chaos. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that if Azura wanted a civil war within the Horizon Empire, they would be able to create one. They were weapons capable of bringing down entire nations. Cecilia herself was one of these people. She was Harbinger 7. Beside her, there were six other Harbingers, and they were all loyal to Azura. They were his hands and feet, his tools of chaos and it was because of the fact that Cecilia had defied him that Azura regarded her as his greatest failure. 
never before had he failed to raise a harbinger. And while Riker knew that there were deeper conflicts between the two, Cecilia never spoke of it. Either way, Dirk was intended to be Harbinger 8. If Cecilia hadn't found Dirk, or more like if the Emperor hadn't stepped in, Azura may have gotten his way. Just the potion withdrawals told her that he had plans that went beyond even Dirk's knowledge. Not even Dirk could have guessed that the thing that was keeping him alive would also be able to kill him. He had been dependent and that was one more tool to use to control Dirk. If Azura had been given more time, then even if it were Dirk, he wouldn't have lasted. Azura would have had another harbinger. But this also caused Riker to sigh in relief. They had gotten lucky. He smiled a bit. We must thank the Emperor. There's not much we can give him. Our skills are more than enough. Especially your skills. And. I have a feeling he'll need us soon. Riker frowned as he spoke ominously. Before Cecilia could ask what he meant though, the doctor came back in to do a checkup. With that, the parents shook their heads, ridding themselves of dark thoughts. Their son was back, alive and, not dead. It was a happy situation, so they enjoyed it. After falling asleep, Dirk didn't wake up for an entire four days. To his parents, it was a coma that wasn't that uncalled for. He had been traumatized both physically and mentally. Now that he was finally safe, his body and mind were recuperating. But while this was somewhat truthful, the main reason was due to Spite. If Dirk knew that Spite was going to knock him out for several days, he may have commanded it otherwise. But since he was deep asleep, it wasn't his problem. And in fact, Spite wasn't just recklessly playing around with Dirk's body. Over time, his situation only continued to deteriorate, beyond what even the doctor was aware of. While the potion that the doctor gave him frequently helped, it wasn't enough. Spite realized that Dirk's body truly was dependent on the potion in every sense of the word. At some point, he stopped being able to live without it. And removing this dependency could now only be done in two ways, according to Spite's observations. 1. He could expel all his existing bodily systems like his organs and muscles, and then regrow them. The regrown systems wouldn't be dependent. Of course, this method was close to impossible. And if he did go down that route, it would take years to recover. It wasn't feasible. So then there was option 2. Dirk's body needed to adapt, replacing the potion with natural genetic and magical systems. This was what Spite worked on and Spite had small success. Dirk's genetic code was changed and adapted, slowing his deterioration. His blood that was filled with mana and anima also helped, seemingly attempting to replace the function of the potion automatically. After all, potions were both material and magical. But even after four days, Spite wasn't able to solve the root of the problem. Dirk's body continued to destroy itself, and only with the potion the doctor gave was he able to stay alive for a bit longer. It was no longer a matter of weaning him off. It all came down to when his body adapted. It was on the fourth day of his sleep though that something outside happened. Spite had always sat with Dirk and watched the surroundings, keeping a keen eye out like an actual cat. So when a man came walking into the room followed by Dirk's parents, Spite turned its attention. Spite was like Dirk who saw things through mana. Thus, when it saw the dark mana around the man be purged in its entirety, it raised its vigilance. Even more so when it felt pressured by the man's presence. He was a beacon of absolute power. Growl. Spite couldn't help but let out threatening sounds as the man approached Dirk's bedside. Cecilia saw this and stepped forward. Black Cat, this is the Emperor, an ally. Isn't this interesting? The Emperor, the man with the overpowering presence, mumbled as he looked at Spite. Spite looked back with its golden eyes as if telling him to keep distance. The Emperor ignored the cat though as he quickly shifted his gaze to Dirk. He wanted to see this child who now turned out to be another harbinger. When he looked at Dirk's body though, he got a glimpse of what was happening inside of him. Nobody knew how powerful the Emperor was but it was generally agreed upon that he was the strongest existence in the empire, and one of the strongest in the world. He could easily see Dirk's entire situation with but a mere glance. 
Of course, it was rude to probe a person's body with magic, but when the emperor saw what was happening, he couldn't help but look deeper. Your son is continuously dying. Sorry? Cecilia's eyes widened at his words, her worry suddenly surging. His body is destroying itself. Without that potion, he can't live. He's fully dependent on it. If left alone, he would need a constant potion stream for the rest of his life. W what? But? It seems like he's doing something about it, as impossible as that sounds. The emperor leaned over as his deep voice shook Cecilia's ears. She stood back. Unlike most people, Cecilia knew that the emperor was someone who wielded the fire and light elements. Fire was his primary specialization, but he was absolutely powerful with the light element as well. That meant he likely knew how to heal, and he could help Dirk. After a while, the emperor smiled. He looked at Spite who still maintained its vigilant gaze. Hard at work? This should lighten your load. Do make use of this opportunity. The emperor put out his hand. And it was a red pearl. Cecilia was surprised. That's a bit of condensed bone marrow from an unknown anima-type monster that I was given. If used in alchemy, it would be a great ingredient for healing potions. Normally nobody would have much use for it by itself. But, this case is special, isn't it? The emperor moved his hand to spite. The cat looked at the red pearl, then back at the emperor. Standing, it grabbed the pearl with its mouth before walking to Dirk and dropping it in his. Dirk swallowed the pearl unconsciously. Nothing immediately happened after that, but the emperor knew the changes that were going to come about. He nodded to spite. That wasn't all though. The emperor grabbed Dirk's arm seeing how spite was a bit less vigilant. He looked at the metal tattoo and the large number 8. This will be easy to take care of. Right as he said that, he pointed one of his fingers at the tattoo. A sharp flame ignited on the tip, and he lowered it to the metal. Under that fire, the tattoo just burned away. The emperor traced all the metal before getting rid of the large number 8. Raw skin was left behind where the tattoo was, but it immediately healed when he used some light magic. All traces were gone. Good. As for this. Finally, the emperor frowned. He looked at Dirk's eyes. The cloth had long been removed, exposing the cursed cracks underneath. Can you restore his vision? I don't know. The emperor mumbled unsurely at Cecilia's question, touching the cracks. A strand of light came out of his fingers, seeking to purify the dark curse. Right when the light touched the cracks though, the emperor pulled back. Dirk's body also momentarily shivered, blood seeping from his eyes. Damn you, Azura. What happened? The curse is almost linked to his life. It ingrained itself deep, only stopping before being engraved into his soul. My power is enough to erase the curse, but Dirk isn't strong enough to survive the backlash. As of right now, he's stuck with it. At the very least, it doesn't go beyond blinding him. It seems like Azura isn't stupid enough to ruin a harbinger over a bit of frustration. The emperor backed away while Cecilia clenched her fists. Well, your son will be fine, regardless. Thank you, emperor. Cecilia bowed a bit, as did Riker. Although Dirk wouldn't get back his vision, he was going to live. That's all they cared about. The emperor turned back to them. On another note, your son is, a bit special. Rest assured, once he recovers, he'll be able to go back to things like normal. Azura won't try anything, so even if he's alone, there won't be any lingering threats. And, here's something that belongs to him. The emperor brought up his hand again. And it were two books. They were Dirk's two training manuals. I got them while going through the mountain, along with a few other books. Tell Dirk that, although I know it's not entirely his fault, he shouldn't withhold original magic texts. Original texts? My son has never even seen one. Due to the whimsy of a certain someone, he actually has. He's not in trouble and he probably didn't get anything from it, but nevertheless, just pass along my message when he wakes. He'll know what I'm talking about. 
I don't blame him for getting roped into trouble if it's that man. Garol. Riker spoke the man's name as he guessed some of the situation. He nodded to the emperor. I will speak to my son. Sure. Then, I must go. In fact, Marquis Strider, since you're here, I ask if you could walk with me. Of course. Riker nodded, the two men walking out together. Cecilia watched them before turning back to Dirk. If she was being honest, at this moment, she cared about nothing other than her son. Tensions are only getting worse. The Emperor spoke as he and Riker left the hospital building they were in. The hospital was actually inside of the palace that was in the center of the city of Calaba. The palace was massive and luxurious, so it had many functions while being inhabited by the highest profile persons in the city. A butler showed the two to a secluded room. Inside this room there were already a few other people who looked more like soldiers. One of them was specially decorated with medals and royal robes. He had a sharp demeanor, his eyes hiding vast wisdom. General. Emperor Horizon. The general bowed at the waist before nodding to Riker. Riker nodded back as the three approached a table. There was a magic map on it as well as a few papers. The emperor continued his original statement. Our southern border is already experiencing conflict. It's been a problem for a couple years now, but it's become especially bad in the last few months. The Dark Kingdom has deployed a large portion of their forces and we've had no choice but to respond. There haven't been any battles and we've entered a stalemate. Now, it's about time for diplomatic negotiations. This is where the problem lies, though. Emperor, if I may ask, why is there such sudden friction? There haven't been any major changes, and because the Queen of the Dark Kingdom has been the sole ruler for hundreds of years, there aren't any political shifts to worry about. Has the Queen perhaps had a change of heart? Riker asked. Since he was here, it was obvious the Emperor wanted to include him in this discussion. The Horizon Empire occupied the northwestern part of the massive continent. Below them was the Dark Kingdom who occupied the direct western section of the continent. There was only one supercontinent in this world, and it took on the form of a poorly shaped donut. Around it was ocean, and in the center of this donut continent was a small sea. Thus, both the Horizon Empires and the Dark Kingdom's territories extended to both the Central Sea and Outer Ocean. There was a single horizontal line that comprised their border. It was the part of the border that was near the Central Sea where this friction was being seen. Riker had actually heard of this progressively worsening situation, as had the rest of the Empire. Only, the Dark Kingdom wasn't giving any reasons for their sudden aggression, so it was causing a bit of panic. Now, the two opposing forces had finally entered a stalemate. There would either be talks or an immediate battle. Of course, nobody even thought that the Dark Kingdom would just suddenly go to battle without stating their reasons. Not even their own citizens would allow that. Thus, they were waiting for messages to be sent. But the Horizon military wasn't one to just sit back and wait. They had already collected intelligence. The Emperor stood imposingly. You're correct that the Queen of the Dark Kingdom has dominated her people for hundreds of years. And usually, when political shifts or even uprisings are seen, they're promptly taken care of. But this time, it's everyone. The entire political circle of the kingdom is calling for change. And not even the queen is stopping it. From what I've heard, it's actually economic, the reasons for their aggression. Resource shortages? The opposite, actually. They've recently experienced surges in industry and capital. The entire kingdom is in an economic boom. But this is the source of conflict. The Dark Kingdom frequently trades with the Elven World Tree, as well as us. But they don't directly trade with the most prosperous empire in the world. The Dwarven Haven. Correct. We could be said to be inhibiting them with our territory. And they're pushing military forces toward the land that would connect them with the dwarves. What does that tell you? They want a direct channel with the dwarves. But is that not something we can facilitate? We fought the bloody war with them fifty years ago, but things have settled. If anything, this could be a chance to strengthen our ties. 
That's a good question that we'll have to ask. But that's also why we believe there's something else going on. Regardless of what it is, they want our land that connects to the Central Sea. Riker, can I trust you? Suddenly, the Emperor turned. Riker became solemn at the question. This was asking if he wanted to be involved in a deeper struggle that he couldn't back out of. But Riker wasn't afraid of any kind of struggle. He had been a military man before becoming one of the Academy's administrators. He was no stranger to war and battle or even political struggles. War was how he garnered his achievements, specifically his performance in the bloody war he spoke of. Not only that, the Emperor was the reason he was able to get his son back. He had been wondering how to repay him. This was his chance. I, Marquis Strider, am at His Majesty's service. My flame is yours to command. Riker got on one knee, kneeling before his Emperor. The Emperor smiled before patting his shoulder. Rise, Marquis Strider. I accept your pledge. Now allow me to tell you something very important. The Emperor turned to the table. On it was a map of the world. In the center was the Central Sea. There was actually an island within the Central Sea, as well as a land bridge leading to it. The Emperor pointed to the land bridge. The territory around this bridge cannot be taken, no matter what. This is something I will go to war over. I understand. Riker nodded a bit stiffly. If the Dark Kingdom wanted a direct route to the Dwarven Haven, they would be cutting off their access to that land bridge. Now, Riker was understanding how serious of a matter this was. The Dark Kingdom wanted greater prosperity, and the Horizon Empire wouldn't budge an inch. Although the Emperor didn't give him a reason why, it was apparently important enough to go to war over. As Riker understood, the Emperor smiled. This will be important information. Especially when you go as an envoy of the Horizon Empire to engage in diplomacy. I'm sorry. Riker was stunned at the implied command. He composed himself though and frowned. The Dark Kingdom hasn't said anything to us, though. Well, they haven't said nothing. In fact, if not for the recent conflict, I would have thought they were being friendly when they sent me this. The Emperor took out an envelope as he said that. He handed it to Riker. An invitation to the annual holiday, Advent of the Dark Dragon. They sent me this a month ago. The holiday is in five weeks. I'm currently planning on sending you, a duke, and some other delegates. What do you say? It should be a relatively enjoyable trip. If you believe I am fit, then I will be your envoy. Good. Then that's all I have for you. Tomorrow I will go back to the capital. Take your time here before returning with your son. And since you are my envoy now, I will give you this. The emperor held out his hand. And it was a ring with a large metal seal on it depicting a large sword and a flame. It was a royal seal, and out of the three ranks of silver, gold, and crystal, it was a gold seal. That seal will give you access to any teleportation platform in the empire, as well as a large sum of money to access from the treasury among other special items. I know the artifact you used while in the war was taken back upon your discharge. Go ahead and grab it from the Imperial Armory. Thank you, Emperor. Of course. And? The Emperor suddenly had an odd smile. His gaze turned toward where Dirk would be located, as if seeing him through the walls. When you go to the holiday in five weeks, take your son with you. Ethan? Dirk? Riker went quiet. His son Ethan was in the military, so he figured the Emperor would mean him. But it was actually Dirk he specifically wanted to go. This caused Riker to frown though. With everything that had happened, did he want to even remotely involve his son in this? I'll think about it. Of course, but know that I'm insisting this to some extent. Anyway, I'll need to speak to the city governor. He's been itching to have a dinner. All of you are invited, if you so please. With that, the Emperor finally left. Riker was left pondering the future, brooding over the Emperor's suggestion. Chapter 100, Restoration Slash Project It was three days after Dirk was given the condensed bone marrow from the Emperor. At this moment, nobody was in the room with Dirk. 
he had yet to wake up. But suddenly, he started coughing. It was soft at first, but then, each cough let out streams of blood. Spite watched as Dirk turned the bed red. After a while though, the red blood turned clear. He started coughing up a water-like substance. It was potion. A large amount of potion was coughed up. In fact, it was all the potion that was inside Dirk's body, including the blood that was mixed with the potion. Spite was getting it all out. But this set off a reaction. Dirk's body began destroying itself like before. But Spite just let it be. Spite even got rid of the potion drip that was sending more potion into his body. Dirk's skin went from healthy to pale white. His subsiding coughs came back as he let out more blood. It looked like he was dying. But Spite waited. And sure enough, after twenty minutes of this, Dirk still wasn't dead. His body was destroying itself, but it was also keeping itself alive. Spite viewed the energies in Dirk's body. The anima in his blood streamed into the organs and flesh that were breaking down. The decaying cells were rapidly replaced by his blood and natural regeneration. The earth mana inside of Dirk seemed to make his still alive body parts remain that way, making his flesh stronger and more resilient. The fire mana seemed to blaze with vitality. Several of Dirk's biological systems rapidly failed and broke down. But as they did, the fruits of Spite's labor kicked in, and they were rebuilt just as fast. The nanites in Dirk's body were especially active. They moved with Dirk's body, both following its commands and giving out its own. The two worked in harmony, and Dirk's physical body was constantly rebuilt. It was a cycle of death and reconstruction that occurred everywhere from the muscles to the organs to the bones. And then, once everything had run its course, Dirk's body settled. It then surged in vitality and strength. Alert! Skill acquisition detected. You have gained the skill, Restoration, Grade 5. Dirk's complexion quickly recovered after this notification was seen by Spite. The cat sat there, an odd sense of satisfaction gracing its mind. Then, it tilted its head. He's a man. He likes women. Should I be a girl then? I don't have a humanoid body, but he'd like the voice better than a robotic one. Ugh. Dirk grunted as Spite began to trail off with its, her, thoughts. He wiped his face that had blood over it. Welcome back. Spite called out with a slightly more feminine voice. Dirk rapidly saw what happened with his body, including the skill acquisition. Instead of being happy though, he sat up with a frown. When he pushed himself into a standing position, he felt his muscles that were strengthening by the minute. He was still weak, but he was going to recover. He was also hungry. But this sensation was overshadowed by the surge of rage he felt. That. That son of a bitch. Bang. He turned and swung his leg, kicking the bed. The metal of the bed frame was dented by his bones, also leaving behind small fractures and split skin on his shin. That damned scum. Fucking no life. You think you can get me addicted to potions? Do you have nothing better to do? You, you almost had me. When I get my hands on you, I'll restore your sight just to gouge out your eyeballs. Ack! Boom! A wall was cracked under Dirk's powerful fist. He took deep breaths of frustration, reining himself in. He turned his head, seeing his mother in the doorway. And seeing her sorrowful face made him feel bad. She was worried about these kinds of things, and he had tried to lessen her guilt. Now he slipped up. He looked at her straight though. He wasn't going to apologize. Instead, he felt something else. He suddenly remembered two and a half years ago when he was first taken. He remembered the hate in his mother's eyes when Azura stopped her. He remembered what she said. I'm going to hunt you down. I'll kill every Azura I find. I'll dismantle everything you've worked for. I may not be able to kill you, but I'll ruin everything you've built. Before, he had understood her words from the standpoint of bringing down an enemy. To destroy an enemy, it was natural to destroy everything they've built. Bring them down while their kingdom crumbles. But now, he understood it differently. 
Was it revenge? Vengeance? No, Dirk didn't want to get back at Azura, returning the pain he gave him. This wasn't an eye for an eye situation. No, it was just sheer rage and hate. Dirk couldn't stand the thought of Azura gallivanting around the world doing as he wished. He couldn't stand Azura getting what he wanted. He was his nemesis, an enemy that he must bring down at all costs. By all things holy I will hunt you down and bring you to your knees. And I'll be damned if I don't have fun doing it, just like you had fun watching me shed rivers of blood. Dirk made his vow with a sharp smile. The smile quickly went away though as he turned toward Cecilia. Mom. Yes, my child. You said that you'd bring him down. Cecilia shivered a bit at his words. Was his resentment finally spilling out? She stood there as she prepared to accept any hate he had for her. Dirk couldn't help the corner of his mouth that twitched upward. But. I'm kind of glad that you didn't. I suddenly had some ideas. I was thinking you and I could work together. We could go on a couple dates like before, destroy some hideouts, maybe kill a couple of Azuras. It'll be our mother and son project, except the project is hunting down Azura's damned organization and not somewhat carving like in school. What do you think? I guess it might be a bit weird for me to say that so outright. I like it. Cecilia suddenly spoke. After being stunned for a bit, she raised her head with her hands on her cheeks. She seemed oddly happy. I love it. Me and my son, hunting down heathens like pathetic cattle. Plotting out their demise and watching them fall into despair as everything crumbles around them and their souls shatter into damnation. And, chaining Azura up like a dog, torturing him for hundreds of years as his lifespan slowly reaches its end. I'm sorry. Cecilia suddenly stopped her wild imagination with a red face. Meanwhile, Dirk was a bit taken aback, though he quickly recovered. He walked over to his mother with a smile. So, that's a yes? Yes. I'd love to work with you, my child. We'll take him down together. It. It makes me really happy. My boy is all grown up now. Cecilia quickly hugged Dirk, squeezing him tight with a big smile. Dirk also smiled, though he clenched his teeth as his weakened body was crushed a bit. Ah, uh, Mom. Oh. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I'm all right. Dirk chuckled a bit as he sat back down on his bed. He still had blood on him as well, but it didn't seem like his mother saw it at all as she got some on her clothes after hugging. I've overcome the dependency. I'm just recovering strength now. Ah, is there food I can eat? I'm really hungry. Of course. Stay here. I'll be right back with a meal. Cecilia rushed out with those words. Dirk just sighed, relaxing his body that was still repairing itself. Well, that was new. Right? A little sadistic, but that's all right. It's fine if it's mother. On the other hand, you've got some explaining to do. A week? I'd like you to tell me before putting me in a coma. Dirk shot a glare at the cat beside him. The cat just responded with a weird smile. Excuse you, but I was keeping you alive. I even got you a skill. You know, you're quite sassy for an AI. I'm a cat. I do my best. Spite raised her head as if smirking at Dirk. His mouth twitched as he picked her up by the scruff. And that voice. What's with that? I thought you'd like a bit more personality to the voice inside your head. My compliments sound better now since I'm a girl, right? What? What compliments? All I've been getting is attitude. Does it naturally come with the female tone? Oh, my bad. Should I praise you for a successful recovery? What a stud muffin. Oh wait, that was me. Wah. Shut up. After a bit of bickering with the cat, Cecilia came back with a large platter. Dirk dropped spite before digging in. The food that fell into his stomach was digested as if lit on fire. Cecilia made sure to bring many large servings, and it was the highest quality food in the city. Dirk felt tears come to his eyes as he ate the unfathomably delicious food. 
he swore never to eat slop again. Nutrients were infused into his body along with rich sources of mana. Dirk could feel his body recover as it happened. His muscles grew, his bones hardened, his organs were vitalized. Everything that had been breaking down was brought back to its peak shape. It wasn't long before Dirk got the strength to fight again. Even Cecilia was startled by his sudden changes. That was when he told her. I got a skill. It's called restoration, and it's grade 5. Ah, skill? Yes. How? She was shocked at his words. Dirk was only 16, and he had already gotten a skill. Since when were skills so easy to get? Dirk shrugged. I just got it while recovering. Spite told me about the bone marrow the Emperor gave me, so I think that was it. Spite? The cat. Spite walked over at that moment. Cecilia nodded in understanding, but quickly became curious. So you two can talk? We can. Oh. Well hello. Hello. Spite nodded her head at Cecilia's surprise. She heard a feminine voice, becoming even more curious about the nature of the cat. Dirk spoke while eating. Anyway, I got that skill. I also have two others. Both are grade 5. There's a technique called mana lungs and my mana heart technique. I got a skill after reaching tier 3 and perfecting its usage. Now I breath in mana passively. I see that. Cecilia nodded. She was powerful and naturally sensed Dirk's effects on the surrounding mana. The second skill is called mana resonance. I got it while learning to enchant. Wait, resonance? Ah. Uh. Cecilia suddenly became hasty, activating magic and creating an isolation barrier around them. Dirk perked up as noodles fell from his mouth. Dirk, sweetie. Just a little advice, but never speak of that skill to anyone. Why? While in enchanting class, they probably called the ability to enchant a gift, right? Yes. His brow raised, despite not being able to use his eyes. Cecilia shot him a weird smile. Well, it's not. Truth is, the industry is heavily controlled and monopolized. They will come after you if you're found to know the truth about enchanting. While it isn't some revolutionary secret to know, the world's economy could shift if the knowledge were widespread. Although nothing will happen to you with me around, I'll still advise you to just keep that skill a secret. Okay? Dirk was a bit confused. He had inferred that details about enchanting were being hidden, but he didn't realize it was such a big deal. Still, some people would do anything for money and control, so he understood to just keep a tight lip. Not that he would go speaking his skills to any random stranger anyway. Nonetheless, I'm very happy that you've trusted me enough to tell me. And very proud that you got those skills. Such a talented child. Cecilia rubbed his head with a happy smile. Dirk just smiled as he continued eating food. She watched Dirk eat a bit, also taking little bites herself here and there. Once he was full, he looked noticeably healthier. She nodded at that. I guess if you're healthy, we can head back to the capital soon. Your father has already returned for some work. As for you, once we get back, you should work on your mana technique. I can also take you out for some excursions. I've already hit most of them, but there are still remnant Azura groups that remain in the capital. All right. Only if you're okay with it. Cecilia's voice quieted a bit. Dirk. I know what you went through was horrible. It's a hell I wish you were never put through. But the things they taught you, they can be used. The lethal magic, the movement techniques, the knowledge, the protocol. Azura wanted to turn you into a harbinger. You'll begin to learn what that means later, but what you were taught was truly specialized stuff. We're here now, and if you're ready, we can move to turn the abilities Azura gave you against him. If you're ready to spill blood and massacre the hundreds and thousands under Azura, then I'll support you. But only if you're ready. You're not going to be forced to do anything. It's okay, Mom. Dirk quickly replied to his mother's worry. He smiled with no amount of hesitation or conflict. Azura doesn't deserve the goodness of my conscience. 
I've already killed some of his men. I was more happy than anything else then. So I plan on enjoying our work. And it'll be fun to enjoy it with you, Mom. I'm the luckiest mother in the world. Cecilia sniffled a bit as she fanned her face in happiness. Dirk chuckled a bit awkwardly. Was there another mother in this world that encouraged the coordinated massacre of assassins? Probably not. He thought he was lucky though. I'm the luckiest child in the world. Dirk and his mother took another day to explore the city of Calaba, going on their own date. While doing so, Cecilia happily told him about the recent news she heard from her husband. The border friction, the dark kingdom, the potential outbreak of war, and the upcoming holiday that the emperor suggested Dirk go to. Dirk was a bit surprised by all this information that was likely confidential. Other than that, she went on and on about the things that Dirk missed over the last couple of years. Ava was now a fourth year at the academy, and her power had grown greatly under Cecilia's tutelage. She constantly went on dungeon dives, sharpening her combat skill. Her skill in alchemy also increased, now being one of the top junior alchemists in the academy. And from Cecilia's words, she had grown quite a bit just like Dirk, turning into a very fine young woman. Cecilia couldn't help but snicker a bit as Dirk got a bit restless over her mention. Alec had also gotten famous. In his age group, he was one of the strongest and most valiant fighters. He had formed a powerful group for dungeon diving, one that included Ava. He was also known for taking on jobs that included hunting down bandits and guarding caravans, becoming a reputable defense force. It was said that he'd be joining the military soon. Other than that, there wasn't much that Dirk had missed. Cecilia also mentioned Tobastin who had become worried after Dirk disappeared as well as Geralt who disappeared not long after Dirk did. Geralt's whereabouts were unknown, a sentence that gave Dirk an odd feeling of fear. Dirk and his mother took in all the sights and pleasures the city had to offer. Food, drink, gambling, music, and shows. There seemed to be everything in this city. If it were a bit more modernized, Dirk would think he was walking through a city on Earth. In fact, this place was a bit more fantastical with floating lights of mana and magicians performing grand parlor tricks for the crowds. Of course, if Dirk could see more, he would likely enjoy it more. But he could get the gist of the things going on around him, so he just enjoyed himself and his happy mother. His dark mana vision was at least getting better bit by bit. And when the next morning came, Cecilia took Dirk to a large square near the center of the city. From this place, people and merchants appeared and disappeared with vast waves of dark mana. It was a teleportation platform, and with it, one could be teleported to several other cities in the empire. There was one such platform in the capital city, though Dirk had never seen it. Apparently it wasn't well known since only the richest merchants and highest profile persons could use them. Either way, Dirk was stunned as the two were teleported to the capital in an instant. It wasn't long before they left a massive building, walking onto the busy streets of the capital city. Waiting for them was Riker. Hello dad. Dirk. It's good to see you kid. Riker smiled. Although Dirk had grown a lot, he was still taller. The next moment though, Riker frowned. I went to go find Ava before you came here. Really? Where is she? I'm not sure. Riker looked a bit concerned, causing Dirk's worry to rise. Their residence is completely empty, 